This long, dark, restless night is nearly done. The morning star shows it is nearly day. The morning lark and owl now sing as one. The owl is flying home. The lark will stay. This long, dark, restless night is nearly done. As from my darker dreams I turn away and cling to dawn's faint hope, rise with the sun, the morning star shows it is nearly day. This long, dark, restless night is nearly done. The morning star shows it is nearly day. Well, hello, good morning, and welcome to another edition of From the Conservatory. The temperature's dropping outside and the heaters are on in here, but at some point, From the Conservatory may need to move to become From the Study, but we'll keep this location as long as we possibly can so that you get the feeling of familiarity that a fixed location brings. Today's the first Sunday of Advent, and so we welcome you to a time of waiting patiently and expectedly for that amazing arrival of God into our world with all the vulnerability and the risk that's associated with it. We really do welcome you to the service here today whether you're watching on the YouTube premiere or at some later date or whether indeed you're online or via the DVD or the CDs. We hope that you feel a part of the wider community that is the church as you engage with the songs, the prayers and the thoughts that we bring to you today. Thank you for all the kind words that you've sent to me over the past week. It's lovely to hear how God's love is spreading across our community and how much you're getting from the services. And as we run up to Christmas, rest assured that we will aim to bring you material that will help you to still engage with the Christmas message, even though we may not be able to meet together physically. Advent is a time of waiting, of centering ourselves once more on the promises that God brings to his world. And so we're going to mark the first Sunday of Advent with the usual lighting of the Advent candles. The first candle in our crown is lit for the first time Jesus came to earth. A shining example of how we should live. Light of the world from this humble birth. Jesus, help us to live more like you spirit-filled and shining bright. O come, O come, Emmanuel. Amen. Advent for me is a time of excitement, uh, of anticipation, the opening of doors on the calendar and the preparation for something wonderful. But at the same time, especially in recent years, there's been a sense of panic and anxiety as I think about all the work that's entailed in the run-up to Christmas. Advent is an opportunity to remind ourselves of the enormity of a God that loves us, a God that pauses eternity to dwell within the moment, to inhabit our world in a personal and intimate way for the blink of an eye, to experience humanity in all its messiness and uncertainty. We sing about that expectant waiting now, about the liberation of our hearts and minds and God's outrageous plan to demonstrate his love for all creation in our first song, which is a rendition of that old hymn, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. O come, O come, That mourns in lonely exile here 
That song always marks for me the beginning of the Advent period. It's like the clapperboard going down on a film set and the director shouting the word action. That invitation to Jesus to enter our world, the desperation in its tone as we recognise the need within, not just our lives but in our world as a whole, for something different, for something that we can trust. 
This time of preparation calls us to reflect on the realities of our world, to understand and acknowledge the limitation of our religious, political and financial institutions. To recognise that truth that there must be more, that we have a purpose, a calling, a reason for being. Advent is that pregnant pause in our lives, the uncomfortable silence that demands to be broken. We feel that desire to engage with our Creator, to scream out the question, why? To fall at the foot of the manger, under the shadow of the cross, only to lift our eyes and gaze into the eyes of our loving Heavenly Father. So we attempt to bring all of that together now into words as we bring our prayers to God. So let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, it's the first Sunday in Advent, a season of anticipation and celebration, a time to reflect on every good thing you've already done for us in Jesus and the glorious things yet to be realised. You've made promises that you alone can keep, you give peace that can be found nowhere else. You've pledged a hope you alone can fulfil. We praise you, we bless you, we worship you. As Advent progresses, fill us to overflowing with gratitude, humility and joy. Father, grant us intense longings like the ones that filled the hearts of the prophets. The promise of grace and the Spirit of Christ thrilled them as they anticipated the era of the Messiah, the time when you would begin to make all things new through Jesus. And grant us joy-filled intrigue, like that felt by the angels. Your heavenly servants were overwhelmed as they pondered your unfolding story of redemption and restoration for men and creation. We are the people the prophets were speaking about. We are the people's angels envied. Let our hearts respond with hallelujahs many times over. Long expected Jesus, you have come and you are coming again. Fill our hearts and minds with the realisation of the Christ in all creation, so that we may embody the promises you bring to the world, so that we may wait patiently for your kingdom of peace hope and love to be manifested in our lives. You are the desire of every nation. You are the joy of every longing heart. By your all-sufficient merit, you have raised us and you will raise us yet. So we pray with gratitude and anticipation in your loving and triumphant name. Amen. Let's join together in the modern words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. So we're going to hear our first reading now, which comes from yet another letter that Paul wrote to one of the churches he'd been influential in establishing. This time, the church in Corinth. Once again, we see in this passage the love and gratitude that Paul has for this community of believers and Paul's instruction to them to maintain their practices of peace, love and grace. So reading from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 1. And verses 3 to 9 and I'm reading from the message version of the Bible may all the gifts and benefits that come from God our Father and the Master Jesus Christ be yours every time I think of you and I think of you often I thank God for your lives of free and open access to God given by Jesus there is no end to what has happened in you it's beyond speech beyond knowledge. The evidence of Christ has been clearly verified in your lives. Just think, you don't need a thing, you've got it all. All God's gifts are right in front of you as you wait expectantly for our Master Jesus to arrive on the scene for the finale. And not only that, 
but God himself is right alongside to keep you steady and on track until things are all wrapped up by Jesus. God who got you started in this spiritual adventure shares with us the life of his son and our master Jesus. He will never give up on you. Never forget that. Amen. It's story time again and this time we're going to hear a beautiful story by Peter H. Reynolds which is simply entitled The Dot. The Dot by Peter H. Reynolds. Art class was over, but Vashti sat glued to her chair. Her paper was empty. Vashti's teacher leaned over the blank paper. Ah, a polar bear in a snowstorm, she said. Very funny, said Vashti. I just can't draw. Her teacher smiled. Just make a mark and see where it takes you. Vashti grabbed a marker and gave the paper a good, strong jab. There! Her teacher picked up the paper and studied it carefully. Hmm. She pushed the paper towards Vashti and quietly said, Now sign it. Vashti thought for a moment. Well, maybe I can't draw, but I can sign my name. The next week, when Vashti walked into art class, she was surprised to see what was hanging above her teacher's desk. It was the little dot she had drawn, her dot, all framed in swirly gold. Hmph, I can make a better dot than that. She opened her never before used set of watercolours and set to work. Vashti painted and painted a red dot, a purple dot, a yellow dot, a blue dot. The blue mixed with the yellow. She discovered that she could make a green dot. Vashti kept experimenting. Lots of little dots in many colours. If I can make little dots, I can make big dots too. Vashti splashed her colours with a bigger brush on bigger paper to make bigger dots. Vashti even made a dot by not painting a dot. At the school art show a few weeks later, Vashti's many dots made quite a splash. Vashti noticed a little boy gazing up at her. You're a really great artist. I wish I could draw, he said. I bet you can, said Vashti. Me? No, not me. I can't draw a straight line with a ruler. Vashti smiled. She handed the boy a blank sheet of paper. Show me. The boy's pencil shook as he drew his line. Vashti stared at the boy's squiggle. And then she said, Please, sign it. The end. The other day, Jackie and I, inspired by a Facebook post that I'd seen, were trying to remember the first films that we ever saw at the cinema. I can remember trudging through the Middlesbrough High Street to the Odeon Cinema to watch the Disney film The Rescuers and returning home via Debenhams where my mum and dad bought my sister and I a cuddly Barnard Mouse toy each. It spoke, it was wonderful, he pulled a string and it gave a whole range of quotes from the film. Jackie's first film was, we think, the much darker tale of Watership Down, which, if I remember correctly, was personally one of the most traumatic experiences of my own childhood. We've always loved films in the Phillips household, and brought both Matthew and Charlotte up to respect the cinema code of ethics. No talking, no eating too loudly, no asking questions when the film is on. And with that in mind, I remember the excitement that both Matthew and Charlotte felt when they were younger, in watching the high school musical movies. As I read today's story, I was reminded of a song in the second, and actually the weakest, of the three films, in which one of the characters insists that he doesn't dance, only to be shown that dancing is no different to playing baseball. I know, don't even get me started on that. 
How often though do we say those words within our own lives? Not, I don't dance, but I can't, or I don't. As a teacher, I used to hear it almost every day, with pupils saying that they couldn't do maths or they couldn't draw, just like Vashti in our story. This was often accompanied with the statement, I don't get it. Paul is at work in Ephesus with his friend, brother Sothenes, preaching the gospel to the Gentiles. He's about 550 miles from Corinth, which was a long trip in those days. And he's heard of divisions in the church there, where he spent nearly 18 months. Paul begins his letter by saying that they're set aside for a reason. That they live in Christ and can grow to be like him. That they've been given everything they need to do that through God's grace. The dot begins with Vashti scowling at her blank piece of paper after art class. I just can't draw, she says. Her teacher encourages her just to make a mark, to see where that takes her. After Vashti stabs her pencil on the paper, making a dot, her teacher pushes the paper towards her and quietly says, now sign it. Now that's something that Vashti can do. Obviously when she arrives at art class the following week, this picture as we read has been signed uh, and framed and, and she begins to realise that actually she can do much better than that. And so she does lots and lots and lots of dots, expanding and enlarging on her first effort. That inspires <clears throat> the young boy who looks at her dots and wishes that he could draw like her. And there's that beautiful moment when Vashti takes his piece of paper with that tiny squiggle on it and offers it back to him, repeating the words that her teacher said to her, now sign it. To be proud of the little things that we can do and to recognise that they are a step on the journey. One move forward. The first point, the most difficult step in any journey is the first one. Paul in his message and the teacher in Vashti's school are people who encourage, who point out that realisation that is within each of us. We have the ability to do something great if we just step out and try. So often we're paralysed by the fear of getting it wrong, of making a mistake, but there's an old saying, God loves a trier. One step at a time, one mark on a bit of paper, one random act of kindness leading to a whole different world to the one that we live in now, one that becomes so full of love, grace and compassion, all because we deemed to make that first step, that risky step. So the question is, especially at this Advent, what's holding us back? We're going to sing again a song that asks that Advent question, how long until you come to reign? How long until you come again? The words may be new, but the tune is an old one. So I encourage you to join in if you can. We have heard the distant bells. Yeah.
Our Gospel reading for today is taken from Mark's Gospel. This is an action-packed, no-time-to-waste Gospel. The film version of the book, almost. It needs to cram all the information and emotions and thoughts into a two-hour segment on celluloid. Today's reading is towards the end of the story and follows the disciples' amazement at the magnificence of the temple. Jesus is aiming to ground his disciples, to help them to see the path that he himself is taking towards the cross. So from Mark chapter 13 and verse 24 we read, Following those hard times, sun will fade out, moon cloud over, stars fall out of the sky, cosmic powers tremble. And then they'll see the Son of Man enter in grand style, his arrival filling the sky. No one will miss it. He'll dispatch the angels. They will pull in the chosen from the four winds, from pole to pole. Take a lesson from the fig tree. From the moment you notice its buds form, the merest hint of green, you know summer's just around the corner. And so it is with you. When you see all these things, you know he's at the door. Don't take this lightly. I'm not just saying this for some future generation, but for this one too. These things will happen. Sky and earth will wear out. My words won't wear out. But the exact day and hour no one knows. Not even heaven's angels. Not even the Son. Only the Father. So keep a sharp lookout, for you don't know the timetable. It's like a man who takes a trip leaving home and putting his servants in charge, each assigned a task and commanding the gatekeeper to stand watch. So stay at your post, watching. You have no idea when the home owner is returning, whether evening, midnight, cockcrow or morning. You don't want him showing up unannounced with you asleep on the job. I say to you, and I'm saying it to all, stay at your post, keep watch. It seems strange to be talking about waiting this Advent. It seems like that's all we've been doing since before Easter is waiting. Waiting for lockdown to come, waiting for lockdown to end. Waiting for tier systems to be announced, waiting, waiting, waiting. I remember when we were due to go into a national lockdown for the second time this year and Mr Johnson was scheduled to deliver the news to us at 4.30 on a Saturday afternoon only to eventually finally get round to it around 7pm, which delayed Strictly Come Dancing, which quite frankly is simply unforgivable. This Advent I have to say that I've been reluctant to wait. The tree's already up, the lights adorn the house and the wreath is on the door. We've not yet however got to the point that marks the whole season for me. That's the playing of the film It's a Wonderful Life. This film marks the beginning of Christmas for me and marks that transition between Advent and Christmas and reminds me of the promise of hope that Christmas brings to the world. It's a Wonderful Life, along with A Christmas Carol, symbolises that truth that there is hope in our world. They are the signal to me that things will get better, that humanity is better than we think it is, and, with even in the, and even within the hardest of hearts, there's the possibility of love, grace and peace. Sometimes as we look at our world, we can become despondent. We can, and indeed I have, in recent times, asked the question, what is the point? But in Advent, we get the answer to that question. We begin to see that in the waiting, there is a hope that things will get better. Today's passage can seem a somewhat harsh one. To open the Advent season with those words on the face of it, it lacks the warmth and the fuzziness that we associate with the festive season. Where are the jingle bells and the sleigh rides? Where is the gentle fall of snow as children's voices sing out about babies sleeping in clean straw, surrounded by adoring animals? Isn't that what we want to hear about at this time? Not fig trees and clouds and cosmic powers trembling. The reality is that Advent is a time of tension. A time of holding conflicting truths in balance. 
We know where we should be. We know where we want to be, but we're not there yet. In both A Christmas Carol and It's a Wonderful Life, we see the lives of individuals unraveling as choices are made, or rather replayed, as the implications of the actions are revealed to the protagonists. Those two films sit in a juxtaposition with one another, one demonstrating the effect that an individual has had on others for the worse, and the other demonstrating the effect one life has had for the good, and how different life would be if they'd never been there. But despite that, within both films there is an advent truth, that dark times are navigated in order to arrive at the good. The context and background of today's passage focuses on Jesus' teaching to his disciples about the futility of temple worship, telling them that the worship of the heart is what is important. And backing up a bit, we see Jesus in Mark using an interesting turn of phrase. Let the reader understand. Mark may as well have presented them with a flashing neon sign, inviting them to read between the lines. Because here Mark is declaring, I am saying something about the unjust Roman occupation of the Jewish homeland. When he says, let the reader understand, he means, I can't risk being any more explicit. He knows that he's writing about how the good news of God is sometimes in conflict with what Caesar claims is good news. Mark knows that he's writing about Jesus in a way that came to inspire activists such as Martin Luther, John Wesley, Martin Luther King Jr and Gandhi. There is nothing more radical, nothing more revolutionary, nothing more subversive about, against injustice and oppression than the story of Jesus. This is what inspires me and helps me to focus on the work that is before me on the eager anticipation of this season. We wait not just for the birth of a baby, but for the entry into the world of the Creator God, the revolutionary, transformational, inspirational and radical Saviour, who shows this world a better way of being, where love is held at the heart of all things, and where individuals are seen for what they truly are, children of the living, vibrant and passionate God, here is a promise that is worth that expectant waiting, that all creation will be treated with love and respect, and the lowliest will be lifted to the highest of heights. We sometimes see waiting as a passive process, but in this instance it's anything but. This waiting is a time of preparation, like waiting for a birth in our family or a wedding day to arrive. This is a time for painting the nursery, of sending out invitations, of choosing the food, venue and DJ. This waiting is the preparation of our hearts and minds to truly be open to the wonderful liberating love that Jesus brings into this world. This Jesus story, this Advent, those films are all about hope and hope is defined not as a desire for change, but there's a desire for change with an expectation that it will occur. This Advent, let us focus on waiting expectantly for whatever is to come and allow the enormity of the event to sink into our lives, allowing ourselves to be transformed into a people who live to love all creation. Amen. And so we sing of that hope now in our next song. Take heart through trials. Fear not, though fires may burn, you shall overcome. The pain of labour will soon be over. So we sing Take Heart by Keiko Ying. Take heart, dear sisters, fear not, dear brothers, all you.
that idea of Christ's return is one that is not a future promise, but a reality in each of our hearts. Each and every day we remind ourselves of Christ's presence in our world, in our lives, in the whole of creation. We invite Christ to come again, to dwell within us, to lead and guide and demonstrate how we should follow our rabbi in the most authentic way that we can. We recognise that the world in which we live could be better, that whilst it's still wonderful on so many levels, there are still those who struggle, who go without, who are anxious, angry or scared. We recognise that there are those who are hurting and that's our calling to ease the suffering of others, to bring hope into their lives as much as it is to be comforted ourselves. In some attempt to gather all these thoughts together now, we bring our prayers to God. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, as we head into Advent and the season of preparation for Christmas, we lift to you all those who have lost loved ones this year, for whom the festivities will seem bleak, we ask for your special healing and compassionate touch of love, particularly on those who have lost people to tragedies, violence, wars, accidents, despair, or this disease. Let there be something this Christmas, some word, some piece of music, some scripture, some act of kindness, which touches the deep hurt with the balm of the great comforter and gives the living wisdom of the wonderful counselor. We pray that this time of year might be when hearts, spiritual eyes and ears might be particularly opened to informed, prayerful Christian witness. Help us to speak and act the truth and love of Christ to all those who don't yet know how much they are cared for. And help us to show exactly the gentle but effective ways in which you lead us. Listening God, we thank you that you are God with us that we can glimpse your kingdom around us, that we can see the signs of you in the world, that we can be part of your story. Heavenly Father, will you come into the darkness of today's world, to the places where once you walked among us, but are now places of despair, conflict and occupation. Be with those whose stories we've heard and the countless others whose voices are silenced. Help us to be a voice of peace, to speak out against oppression, to share the real Bethlehem with others this Advent. Bring your wisdom to a situation which seems to have no end. Lord, we wait and we listen. Listening God, will you come into the darkness of our community, to the people living with fear and worry, to the people whose Advent is not full of joy, to the people needing support, Open our eyes to the situations all around us that we do not see and open our minds to the ways we can respond. Will you come into the darkness of our lives, to our human doubts and failings, to the times that we do not live out our faith and the situations that we have not used our power to change. Help us to be as open to you as you were to us when you were as vulnerable as a baby trusting in the world for your safety. Show us glimpses of your kingdom and help us to hear your story. Reveal to us our part in your Advent hope as we wait and we listen. Amen. Our closing hymn is another modern adaptation of an old Wesley hymn. Once again, inviting Jesus to come into our world to transform and liberate all humanity. So we sing. Come, thou long-expected Jesus.
Well, thank you once again for spending the last hour or so with us here in the conservatory. I hope that it was beneficial and that you gained some sense that you connected with God and that it was truly worship for you. Please feel free to let us know how Advent is going for you via email, snail mail or a telephone call. And don't forget that if you're watching this on YouTube to click the subscribe button below the screen. There are a whole host of services that will be coming up in the following weeks. So if you haven't followed us on the Facebook pages, then I would encourage you to do so. One of the online events that I'm doing is an online advent calendar, which a couple of short stories each day and building up of a nativity scene. And that'll be on both YouTube and Facebook each day from the 1st of December through to the 24th. So if you have children or know of any families who might like that, then please follow us on our Facebook pages at Roker or Full Well Methodist Church, or here on our YouTube channel. I'm also, as part of our reflective candlelight service, intending to have a short time of reflection for those loved ones who we have lost this year and who we're gonna miss greatly this Christmas. So if you know anyone who might find it a comfort, then if they let me know the name of their loved one and send me a picture, I can include that in the service, which is gonna be online on Sunday the 20th of December. I hope that you have a good week and if you'd like to join us uh, on our post service Zoom chat at 11.30 each Sunday then simply drop me a line and I'll send you the link. I invite you to join me in the words of our blessing. Dear Lord, remind us of our calling to encourage one another in Christian love, 
to show God to our community and to develop our church, worship and society into a place where all can find their home in Christ. Amen. Go in peace, shining God's love and light into the world. And may the blessing of God the Father, Son and Holy Spirit remain with each and every one of us, now and forevermore. Amen.